welcome to it's all connected the podcast featuring some of the best coaches and clinicians in the industry sharing their knowledge and experience on every aspect of health and fitness hey there welcome to my channel and today's guest of honor is mike kentrell so mike kentrell mptc mpt prc is a professional movement and performance consultant with over two decades of experience working with a variety of patients and athletes in all manner of settings across the country and globe mike is a partner and lead performance consultant with applied integration consulting aic which has impacted patients and athletes across the us and throughout europe australia and asia mike's area of expertise centers on helping individuals with chronic pain and enhancing sport performance through integration of neuro respiratory dynamics mike welcome to my channel how are you doing i'm glad to be here i'm doing really fine anchor thank you for taking the time to have me on your show my, my honor my honor i mean your instagram posts are amazing and i learn a lot from it and the way you talk about the dental cranial stuff and its integration with the uh, pelvis and thorax it's really enlightening so i would like to yeah i no no go ahead okay, go ahead okay cool so i would like to know about aic so AIC, Applied Integration Consulting, began in 2016, 2015, around that time frame. My partner, James Anderson, and I, we realized that uh, a lot of people, when they're trying to apply movement principles, don't know how to apply it. They'll learn great movement science, but then, you know, learning the, the, the technical aspects of movement science is one thing, but then taking it and applying it to your patient who's laying there on the table is another. So we saw a need. And so we began to farm ourselves out and say, well, let us help you with patients on the table. It's fun for us and it does help them learn and it helps the patient. And so it, it sort of creates a, a trifecta between James or myself and the therapist or the dentist and the patient. So that trifecta, it, it's, it's mutually beneficial for all parties. The, the therapist is learning exponentially because we're on site. And then the patient is, is getting the benefit of, of two heads are better than one. And so it, it, it works very well all the way around. So we like the idea. So we began doing this and it's kept us busy. Well, it certainly kept us on a plane. And so we spend a lot of time flying everywhere. We'll joke all the time that if you want to get a message to me, just put it on a sticky note and put it on the back of any Delta airline seat. And eventually I'll see it because I'm always on, on a flight someplace. But anyway, so we, um, we saw this need and we began this and, but there was an issue. What the issue was is we saw extreme shortcomings between um, about the base of the neck and the top of the head. Most people in our world don't understand this segment well. And when I say in our world, I mean dentists as well. Dentists don't understand the ramifications of this. And I think that's important because both parties, the movement specialists and the dentists, need desperately to understand this. Because every time I see a patient, they bring their head with them. And if I don't know how to look at their head or their neck or their mouth, then I'm not a complete therapist. So with that in mind, we began trying to sharpen our sword to, to help people understand that, that the head and neck matter and then how to help them understand it. So we began teaching some courses on it. And our most recent iteration of this course is a six-part series that we've called the Master's Fellowship Program. So in that six-part series, we have six four-hour lectures for for movement specialists like physical therapists, occupational therapists, these kind of people who are fascinated with this sort of science, myofunctional therapists who we absolutely must have on our team, and dentists and optometrists. So I'll get more into that in a moment. So these groups, and that's it's not exclusive because we have some, um, we also have in our midst in the courses, we have um, not just dentists, but orthodontists as well, and some periodontists. And a lot of people who you would be surprised would be interested are taking our courses because they want to know the ramifications of what they're doing through this mouth to these bodies. And they're aware that something is happening and they are either causing it 
or helping it. And um, so they're interested in this work. Now, what that's done is it's created an alliance that that is very exciting to me and because it's engendering another series of courses for us under a new banner. And that new banner is Applied Integration Academy. And Applied Integration Academy is fledgling. We don't even have the website built. We're building the website now. And I'm super excited. Now, I've spoken about AIA a year ago, but this is how slow these wheels turn. It takes time to create this and create the underpinning from this. And there are so many things that I want to share with you that I have to wait. I have to zip my lips because if I put it out there too soon, people scan the internet looking for it and they're not going to find it. So right now you have to look under the AIC um, website, Applied Integration Consulting, to find anything. And that's that's fine, but that will end up changing. We're even changing the AIC website now, even as we speak. So there's efforts in that direction. But the AIA, the Academy, is the bigger deal. This, so the Applied Integration Academy, through that Academy, we're developing some very significant hands-on dental training and if therapists want to be there, they can. But first, we want to get a, a stable full of dentists who are anxious to get this material. And we already have it very much well underway from British Columbia to Denmark. We've got, we've got people very much interested and they're excited about the material. So I like that. Dentists and therapists and strength and conditioning people, movement specialists. And a lot of these dentists are movement specialists. And they're, they're excited about that, which I love. I think you're muted. You're muted. Check your mute. Uh, so we need to integrate uh, everything, like from pain to performance. Everything, every field that comes in between needs to be integrated. Absolutely. And I think I, I would echo a lot of other specialists in that light. And, and you as well, Angkor, I think that that, that understanding that it goes from pain all the way to performance and from por performance to pain. This they are they are almost one and the same in my heart. So yes. So so for a normal person watching this video who is not that deep into this stuff, if you could explain how eyes and teeth play a role in movement and or posture, as they say. Absolutely. Um, let's start with teeth and I'll work my way up to eyes. So in, in, within the mouth, on a particular tooth, there are 20,000 nerve endings per square, I think, square centimeter, maybe square millimeter. Very, uh, 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 an exquisite amount of nerve endings. And, um, and then each tooth in the bed, the root of the tooth in the mandible, within the mandible, there are what are called PDLs, periodontal ligaments. These periodontal ligaments tell movement of the tooth. They perceive vibration, compression, and lateral movement of the tooth. These PDLs are, are very much interconnected with proprioceptive sense in the brain. So when you move a tooth in any direction or compress a tooth on one side or the other, front or back, it sends a signal. And it tells the owner where they are in space. So it's a very, very significant proprioceptive tool to help a person maintain upright posture and balance. Now, this is interesting because, you know, in the animal kingdom, we know that um, animals that are born with back teeth can immediately stand up. Humans are not born with back teeth. And it takes about nine months, 10 months, 11 months for the back teeth to erupt, and then they can stand up as well. When people are later on in life, in life, as they lose teeth, they start losing balance. Now, I'm making an extrapolation. Later on in life, losing balance in teeth, maybe they would have lost their balance anyway. But I think it's worth a study to understand, oh, okay. is there a correlation between uh, loss of occlusal reference and loss of balance. And I think there is. Many yeah. times, we have, there's so many um, research projects on orientation of feet and orientation of skull bones. So it would make sense to me. So coming back now. So teeth themselves as proprioceptive organs 
They're the only proprioceptive organ we have in our bodies that we happen to chew with. Mm. We don't have any other body part that we chew with that also tells us where we are in space. So this to me is something that's a, a fascinating concept. So these teeth, these periodontal ligaments give us inter introspection, an introspective perspective of balance, coordination, and positioning. With that in mind, if we have, it, it doesn't mean that malocclusion guarantees loss of balance. That's ridiculous. It can be a preventative for correction of position. And likewise, let's say that you're an orthodontist. So Ankur, the orthodontist, has a patient with crooked teeth. Ankur takes the crooked teeth and makes them straight. Well, that should fix the patient, right? But maybe no, because maybe the teeth were crooked because the body was crooked. Let's oversimplify. And if the body's crooked, the teeth are following the body. Mm -hmm. So now if I straighten the teeth, what I've done is reinforced a crooked body because mm -hmm. now the teeth being powerful proprioceptors say all is well, but it's not. Now the patient after having orthodontics comes in with shoulder pain, neck pain, back pain, hip pain, knee pain, all because of the ortho that they received. Now the ortho isn't responsible. They don't even know they've caused that problem. And the patient doesn't even know to talk to the ortho about the problem. The only time they ever do is when the orthodontist tightens wires and the patient says, I've got a headache. And the orthodontist says, well, give it a little while, it'll go away. And they do, and it does. But the problem is that headache is coming. It's coming back. And it may be a, now a new and perpetually longer and longer problem. This occurred with me. So this phenomena of, of tooth straightening on crooked bodies is a problem, oh. just like Crooked teeth perpetuate a crooked body or at least follow a crooked body. Straight teeth on a crooked body can be a problem. Now, if we take this and understand that bites, left and right bites, match left and right bodies, we can realize very quickly that if I'm shifted into my right hemisphere, I should have a right bite. If I'm shifted into my left hemisphere, I should have a left bite. Not obligated, but able. Mm. If I'm able to shift right, I should be able to make right contact. If I'm able to shift left, I should be able to make left contact. But what if I can't? That could be a problem. And it may be one of the reasons why the person is having perpetual symptoms. Okay, fine. Likewise, we know that individuals use their visual field to help perpetuate or negate positioning sense. Now, this kind of makes sense. If I say shut your eyes, you have less balance than you do than with your eyes open. Well, if there's an, in an, an inherent bias to your visual field preference, then we know that you're going to have an inherent bias toward lateralization into one hemisphere or the other. Sometimes what, what we know, and this is from the, the 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 optometrist that I work with, her name is Dr. Heidi Wise, and she used to be huge in Lincoln, Nebraska, She's come to Georgia since, and in the last six, seven years now, I've been working very closely with, with Heidi on development of postural vision and understanding how we can change the focus of what we see to help shift someone's center of mass into the left or right hemisphere as needed. And you hear me saying, as needed into the right hemisphere, because we have multiple patients who have no idea how to shift their center of mass to the right, which is contrary to uh, old learning. And so in the in, in this old orthodoxy, it was always go left, go left, go left, go left, go left. The problem is there are too many people who have gone left, too many people who have broken in their effort to go left, and too many therapists who are frustrated as they're taking patients left when they need to be taking patients right. And I would say to any therapist, if you're having trouble, try taking your patient to the right. You might have some luck. But with that in mind, let's understand that with vision management, you, have, you can use these eyes to help take someone into a particular hemisphere or shift them back and then into a hemisphere. Now, this is, this is something that she is extremely good at and is make, she's in our fellowship program. She is part of our six-part series 
in this master's fellowship program. She is lecture number five. So our optometrist, Dr. Heidi Wise, teaches lecture five to teach guys like you and me how to take people to the right or left using vision. What she'll say, first thing, is she will say, before I start dealing with their eyes, make sure this mouth is stable because this mouth is a trump card for these eyes. And this is not well understood by many people. Now, there are a few optometrists out there that kind of get that, but they are very few. So, you know, we talk about you and I as movement specialists. There's not a lot of us that even understand that a rib cage is important. We don't even get that a rib cage is important. So when we start thinking about rib cages and necks and mouths and eyes, well, the, the pool of people gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You've got some experts out there that get rib cage dynamics. Bill Hartman is an expert when it comes to understanding rib cage dynamics, and I value his opinion highly. And um, the uh, what he teaches is good stuff. And for those that aren't aware of him, they need to go take some of his coursework because I, I value his coursework. And um, and, and I know that he, he values the coursework that James and I do. But um, at any rate... Um, you start looking at this vastly shrinking pool of people who understand with any degree of acuity, the neck, the mouth, the head, and the eyes and cranial strain patterns. Getting dentists to understand cranial strain patterns, even that is a challenge for dentists. Osteopaths get it, that's why they're in our courses, but osteopaths, have a completely different approach because they're not aware of the rib cage dynamics that drive the cranial strain. So we're all busy in our little well, in mm -hmm. our silo, treating patients, doing the same thing. It's like the 10 blind men and the elephant. And one guy thinks the elephant's a snake and the other guy thinks it's a wall. And you know the old story. So we're all the 10 blind men. And, and so it's like we're trying to get the scales off our eyes and back up and go, it's an elephant. And the minute we understand it is, we're all better off. Well, now I'm just preaching in platitudes. What I would say is that for us to fully grasp the neck, the teeth, the eyes, and the skull, it doesn't take trickery. It doesn't take um, fooling the nervous system in another way. Because we can come up with a million ways to fool the nervous system. Hell, I can give somebody a glass of red wine in a hot tub and they'll feel good for a little while. But that's not the approach we need to take. So um, asking someone to wear dark shades may not be the solution. I think we need to understand human kinetics and movement dynamics and understand well that there's a marriage between all of these systems. But not just that. But to understand, yes, it's the marriage, but it's not just the wedding ceremony. It's the life after the marriage. We have to teach you and I how to take and have a patient continue for the lifetime managing this so they're not in trouble. That is all of our obsession. Anybody who's going to listen to this podcast already is a nerd and wants to hear about how to sharpen their sword, how to do better. And it's about carrying the treatment further forward. Otherwise, the patient just comes back with trouble. Now, I'm going to put a period there and add something. It does not mean that I have all the answers. It doesn't. And neither does my partner, James Anderson. You know, we're, we'd, we'd like to think that we know a lot of stuff, but we, we do our best to, to, to move forward on the highway of learning. And maybe I'm further down the highway than somebody else, but there are people ahead of me on the highway and I want to learn from them. And um, what I'm discovering now is a lot of the people who are ahead of me on the highway have DDS after their name, they're dentists. And these dentists have some really good information. And um, right now I'm, I'm with, um, I'm working with uh, Dr. Derek Nordstrom. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he developed the, the, alternate light wire force, the, the advanced light wire functional appliance, the ALF. And I'm, I'm having such a good time. He's such a good man. And he's got such a wealth of knowledge that it's, um, that for him, it, it's just, how do I convey 40 years of learning in five minutes to you, Mike? Well, you know, he can't and, and who could, 
And so I just try to grasp what I can grasp. So by seeing patients with him, I think it helps me learn. And um and and he's very interested in our our um, applied integration academy because he is seeing some things that he's never seen before, and he's seeing the objectivity of what we have. So this my point is that I haven't cornered the market on learning. I haven't cornered the market on this science at all. I'm simply saying. Before you start considering shifting someone left, you might want to think about shifting them to the right. And the only other thing I would say, I think a while back, I put an alligator on my Instagram and um, mm. that was a fun day. But uh, that that I was on that alligator's back. I was extending that alligator. I was trying to convey a message. The message was if an alligator is extended, they can't rotate. If a human is extended, they can't rotate. But what is extending the human? What do I, as I'm sitting on that alligator, what do I represent? I represent an inability to rotate. And it was an inability to rotate that extended the gator. It's an inability to rotate that extends a human. So extension is a compensation. So if all you do is spend your time flexing, you'll never deal with why they're extending. You're just unextending them. And unextending someone is not the solution. Shifting their center of mass correctly into one hemisphere or the other is the solution. This I'm convinced of. And it goes all the way into this skull, which is the, the cloudy area for a lot of learners. They just, they're intimidated by the skull, the mouth, the eyes, and the body combined. So that's that's the big rub. That's the big problem. And that's why Applied Integration Consulting and Academy has turned into what it has. Awesome. Yeah, that was really useful. Teeth and You know, uh, I think you, you would just beg me to shut up at this point. No. <laughs> it's like, uh, put a I, period. I, like you to, <laughs> I, I want to just listen to you because it's a lot of information which makes a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, like you said, uh, old people because when they lose uh, teeth uh, mm -hmm. and it might have some relation with uh, them losing balance. Yeah. And, and as well as them losing the hip internal, external rotation, hip measures, the rib cage getting stiffer because of time spent under gravity is like immense gravity is squeezing us and they're, the water content in the body decreasing and then and they're not being able to change shape as efficiently as they could in their 20s and 30s. So their pelvis and ribcage also are much stiffer. Their, their guts, organs, the internal pressure management, everything combined and then come this, this proprioception from the molars and all. So it's like everything combined will give us, yeah. It's, Hell, it's, I'm living it. I'm, yeah. I'm 64 years old. So I remember when I was 44 and 34 and 24, I was a different moving human. Huh. I also know that um, when I was about 58, I think, I put an ALF in my mouth. That ALF turned off my ear ringing Whoa. and and um, allowed me neck movement that I otherwise didn't have. Hmm. And, and design of an ALF makes a difference. What type of ALF you have in your mouth. This is not me shilling for an ALF. I'm simply saying that device assisted me in allowing me more rotation. Mm -hmm. And the minute I had that, things changed for me very significantly because one of my ear ringing, I have two reasons for ringing in my ears. One of them is some moderate hearing loss in my left ear. Fine. The other is because of hyperexcitation of specific muscles in the anterior neck and within my ear, tensor vili palatini and tensor tympani. Those two muscles, when they're excited, make noise and you can hear it. And that ringing can be obnoxious. The minute I put an ALF in, it's gone. And then I learn to keep it gone without my ALF. I don't have it in right now. I wear it as I need it. If I don't need it, I don't wear it. Right now, I have no, no ringing in my ears. So why would I put it on? But this is not to say that every human, if they put an alpha in their mouth, is going to no longer have ringing in their ears. And mm. I didn't expect to not have ringing in my ears when I put the alpha in. I expected to have a little bit more neck motion, which I got easily. And that afforded me much more body motion. 
So I can't ask someone to turn their body in a certain direction or assume a certain position if they can't. They, they physically cannot. How can I ask them? Hey, do this. And they say, I can't do that. Try. And they try. You're right. You can't do that. Here, let me unlock you with a tool, whatever that tool may be, a pair of shoes, um, a splint, an ALF, a pair of glasses, whatever. Let me unlock you. Take the trifocals off. Now can you? Oh, yes, now you can. So there are ways, and I can use a tool to help unlock a system and then teach this now newly mobile system to move. Well, that's great. And then do I still need the tool? I don't know. Let's see how well you move. How will you know how well I move? Well, the way you know how well someone moves is to test how well they can shift their center of mass into one hemisphere or the other. And that's done through a hemispheric occupational performance exam, H-O-P-E. And this HOPE scoring system basically is an exam that assesses how well you can move your neck, your cranium, your rib cage, your pelvis into a specific hemisphere or the other. Increase the score, you're increasing your ability to move. You'll decrease your symptoms the more you can move. It makes sense. It's why the old guy who moves really well lives a long time. It's why the old guy who doesn't move well dies sooner. Uh, <laughs> it's just that research is out there. So we already know that. The less you move, well, hell, even on the most simple levels, the, the less you move, the more you have to hold your breath. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you get a breath and pick up the phone you dropped on the floor. You get a breath and reach for the trash can. You get a breath and take the milk out of the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. You get a breath leaning forward to turn on the car. True. Every time you have to Valsalva, every time you Valsalva, you're denying yourself mobility. You're increasing your blood pressure. Huh. Every time. Yeah. So there's a direct damaging relationship between immobility and, and um, body dysfunction. The less you can move, the more likely you are to damage body parts, mm -hmm. either directly at a joint through arthritic changes in the joint to indirectly through changes in, in blood pressure, increases in cortisol and hormonal changes as a result of the stress cortisol going up. The more you hold your breath, the higher your anxiety goes, mm -hmm. period, period. If your anxiety is up, cortisol is up. If cortisol is up, you're having a problem now with the rest of your hormonal system. That endocrine system is very, very sensitive. Ask any woman going through menopause. Ask my wife. She'll tell you that that hormonal system is very sensitive. And as a consequence, we see damaging results. You can directly and indirectly trace back issues like that to issues like immobility. The less I move, the more likely I am to, to have trouble and die soon. Yeah. Well, if my skull, if my skull and my neck are locked up, I'm not going to be able to move my body as well. Period. I can rotate my neck to the left. Here I go. Or I can rotate my neck to the left. Here I go. <laughs> so which, which way is appropriate? Both. Both. I should. I can. I can take my neck and laterally flex it to the left. Here I go. Mm. I can take my neck and laterally flex it to the left. Here I go. Mm. In order, now in this position, my right rib cage is depressed and my left rib cage is not. This requires at least five degrees of lateral flexion of my cervical spine. Mm. Likewise, to do the opposite requires five degrees of lateral flexion of my cervical spine. If I don't have five degrees of lateral flexion, I'm not going to be able to do this. Or if I can do this, I might gain five degrees of lateral flexion that I never knew I had. <laughs> because if I don't use it, I lose it. Yes. So the less my rib cage is dynamic, the less neck mobility I'm going to have. Well, wait a minute. I'm 64 years old. If my rib cage is getting stiff, how well am I going to be able to do this? Mm. That's a problem, isn't it? So I better learn how to make my rib cage mobile or I'm going to lose neck mobility. Yes. This is so common sense. So I was out West in California two weeks ago and I was talking, I was doing a talk 
at the Breathe Institute, which is a huge institute um, uh, led by uh, Dr. Zaghi. And he has a Zaghi method, a Zaghi protocol for tongue releases and all kinds of stuff. And I was in the presence of giants in dentistry. And it was an honor to be able to have a couple of hours to speak to them. And after I spoke to them, I was talking with um, Kevin Coppelson, who's got one of the best procedures now for facial expansive surgeries. And um, we were talking about a study that he's about to publish. And the study basically says for every degree of occipital extension, mm. you open an airway 25% not for every degree, for every five degrees. Oh. So if I took a skull and put it on a neck and moved this skull five degrees in toward extension, I'll open the airway 25%. And um, he's about to publish this study. And I said, that's really cool. I said, so if I move my skull like this, I open my airway. And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, that's like CPR, right? And he goes, yeah, yeah. open an airway by extending the skull. That made sense to me. And I said, could you possibly open an airway instead of moving the O on the A, could you move the rib cage? Yeah. Move the rib cage down yeah. and you can go <laughs> intentionally. Now you're creating a O extension. And he said, Oh my goodness. Yes. Can we sit down and talk for a little while? Now I was with <laughs> I, Yeah, and we did. We talked for a good while, and I think we're going to try to create a new study. So I'm excited about that. And I was talking, I was literally in the office with, with a dentist. I love, I adore her. I work with her twice a month in Houston, Texas. And uh, my partner, James Anderson, is down there right now. He texted me a moment ago. He said, hey, I got a question for you. I said, I'm on a podcast right now, so hang on. So anyway, um, Alice, Dr. Lamb, she was in, in there as well. She was the one who arranged this meeting. So the three of us were sitting there. At, it was on a Sunday. Nobody's around. We're just chatting with Dr. Coppelson. Super nice guy. I think the world of him. But anyway, and we got to have this conversation. And were it not for Alice and, and, and her efforts, that conversation would not have taken place. And she is quite a dentist. And um, we tease her. We call her Hurricane Alice because she's just all over the place thinking all the time. And um, and uh between Alice, Alice, who was a part of AIA, she is now a founding member of AIA, the academy that we're building right now. She and um, and uh, Dr. Heidi Wise have been instrumental in advancing the thinking. You know, like if I sit here all by myself, I can learn a little bit. Yeah. But if I sit with, with James next to me, I learn even more. If I have Alice in the room, I learn even more. If I have Heidi on the phone, I learn even more. And so what we're seeing is sort of a snowball effect of four minds. Four minds are better than one. Yeah. And so, and the nice thing is all of our students in class, we invite as, as um, providers of data. So they're, they're in their laboratories creating. And who are we? I mean, we're just us. But to have all of these students who are learning this material and saying, did you think about this? And we're like, no, what, what do you have? And then we begin to look at it and it starts a project. Well, I can tell you that one of the things that we're doing right now is um, we're about to um, present a poster in Chicago week after next. And, um, or is it week after? Yeah, week after next. And um, we'll be there presenting information to the Equi American Equilibration Society, the AES. Now, the AES has spent decades refining the definition of centric relation here at this jaw. And I had the privilege to hear um, Dr. Pete Dawson, who was basically a founder of the AES, um, a wonderful dentist. I, I consider him a mentor and I'd never met him. Same as uh, Dr. Derek Nordstrom, he's a mentor for me and I've never met him because these are forward thinkers. And so you can, you can, you know, you can lean forward and cheat off their paper. So I kind of look and see what they've done. And um, I'm like, this is good stuff. I got to cheat off his paper. And um, and what I what I I got to hear him speak a few years ago, it's about four years ago, and he was speaking on this definition of centric relation and the blood on the walls over the years as they tried to refine the definition and arguing about it, which is very healthy. And um, the blood maybe not, but anyway, so I um after he gave his his talk, I went over and spoke with him and I said, I think we're gonna have to change that definition. And he said, 
oh, who are you? And I said, well, I mean, I'm nobody. I'm just a physical therapist. But um, I think that uh, we're not taking into consideration the orientation of the fossa itself or the state of respiration that the human is in, because I think it affects CR. All we're speaking to with the definition we currently have is movement of the mandible. Mm. But what about the fossa? Mm. And what about the state of lateralization or the state of respiration that we're in? It affects the position of the fossa. And he said, he gave me his card. He said, I want to talk to you later, which I admired. Now, this man was in his 80s. Mm. Well, and uh, a, a few months later, he passed away. Well, let's fast forward four years. And now we're doing a presentation at the AES. Now, this is the American Equilibration Society, one of the most prestigious dental societies in America. And we're going to get to do a presentation on two case studies. And these two case studies basically are explaining how the pelvis and rib cage affect CR. And we've got the data. We've, these are two perfect case studies with perfect objective data. We're going to present this with our extrapolations and our interpretations of that data. And we're going to welcome input from the AES. Now, this is the AES who says this fossa does not move. And we're walking in saying, yeah, it does. And we have to consider it. So I'm super excited about that. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would attribute that to Alice Lamb because she is the one who created this. This is a lady you should have on your podcast. <clears throat> yes, I yes, definitely have. You have Dr. Alice Lamb or James Anderson on this podcast. You'll actually hear something worth listening to instead of this muddy cat because I'm nothing compared to those two guys. I, I, but I, I definitely invite those two people. I want I wanted to know from you uh, regarding sleep apnea. If someone is going through sleep apnea, uh, so your experience over the years, I mean, you like how do you proceed with them? Like rib cage and pelvis first, like getting these cervicals that cervical spine curve which is flattened out over over a period of time how much that can create a create a change and from there on if anything like any uh dental or oral appliances that you need or so, if you could elaborate yeah. so first let's go back in time if we went back in time 15 years dentistry mm -hmm. um if someone brought up um airway, the word airway in dentistry, it was preposterous. They didn't want to talk about it. It's like, come on, that's ridiculous. Now you have an entire subculture in dentistry, like the AAPMD. They're all about airway now. And it's like the AAPMD has grown pretty substantially. So here you have a group of dentists who have gotten obsessed with airway when it was unheard of 15 years ago. They didn't want to talk about it. So there's an issue, though, that that falls within and without the AAPMD, and that is the, in the area of palatal expansion. So when you hear the term nowadays, you'll hear the term biological dentist. And a mm -hmm. biological dentist is someone who ha has a good grasp of airway, but they've got they've got a singular tool, and it is palatal expansion. Mm -hmm. So what that, what they'll describe is we're going to expand a palate using varying devices um, and varying um, degrees of invasiveness, you know, mm -hmm. surgically speaking, um, to expand that palate with the idea that a larger, more expansive airway is what's needed to reduce sleep apnea. Now, they're going, they're going to, and they will, and they have seen cases that have improved dramatically as a result of that concept. Expand the airway and help them breathe better. And you know, you can go online and see a million um, testimonials and case studies about people who've done really well with that. And, and I salute them for that. On the flip side, you also have individuals who may have had the procedure and it wasn't necessary because it didn't change their airway. In other words, it didn't reduce their apnea or, or improve their quality of life or their quality of sleep. Now, those individuals, it, 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 it begins to become mind boggling. Well, how is it that this didn't uh -huh. help them? Their airway is the size of a, of a fire hose. It's giant. The airway is huge. Why aren't they? Why do they still have apnea? It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where someone like Angkor Bhattacharya is going to come in, because what you're going to say is what you said a moment ago. Um, I, I'm confident that if we can affect rib cage and pelvis dynamics and reestablish a 30 degree cervical lordosis, 
wouldn't that assist in airway? And we already know it'll probably help about 25%, right? From what we were talking about a minute ago. So it's uh, the, 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 the operative sentence would be something like, it's not the size of the ship, it's the motion of the ocean. In other words, uh-huh. if, if you've got, a, it doesn't matter how big the airway is, it matters how functional the airway is. Uh-huh. So a person can choke with a giant fire hose airway, they can still choke. And Even the Titanic we, sank. Huh? Even the Titanic sank. Uh, say it once more. Even the Titanic sank. Huge. Yes, even the Titanic. Yes, even the Titanic sank. And so what we have to understand is that while surgical procedures and palatal expansions procedures are great, they're not great for everyone. And if I'm someone who does surgeries like that, I want 100% of my patients yeah. to report positive outcomes. Yes. Well, that always comes through proper screening. This is why so many dentists are in our coursework because they realize, well, before I start pounding on someone's palate, I need to make sure that they're appropriate. You yeah. know, um, chemotherapy is great for someone who has certain types of cancer. But chemotherapy is completely inappropriate for someone with a urinary tract infection. It doesn't matter, right? I don't need chemotherapy for a cold. If I have a cold, I need a little bed rest and some sinus medicine, and I'll be okay in about 10 days. So I don't need chemotherapy and radiation and surgery. So let's make the treatment appropriate for the patient. So it's really not even the, the biological dentist's fault. That's our fault. Because what we should realize is we have to properly treat, properly screen and treat our patients and know when it's appropriate to refer that patient to someone who does airway expansive work. Because what we should see is the majority don't need it. We already know this about back pain. Mm, 85 to 95% of patients actually need surgery for their back. I mean, don't need surgery for their back. That's five to 15% actually do need surgery for their back. That means 85 to 95 don't. Well, who treats the ones that don't? And if we're not successful, what happens to them? They get surgery. And what happens then? They're no better. So it's not a failed back surgery. I'm sure the back surgery was a success. Mm -hmm. It just was inappropriate for that patient. The right person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Correct. It's not a failed palatal expansion. It expanded the palate. Yeah. But that's not what they needed. They needed that like they needed a hole in the head. What they actually needed was the appropriate treatment. So what you brought up earlier is exactly right. What we have to do, though, is we have to expand our model, not our palate, our model, and understanding that we need to know what is available to us. And I can tell you right now, if I have someone with sleep apnea, there's no way. Um, that's what I was about to say is not true. Let me rephrase. Yeah, I could and I would have a decent chance of improving their airway through rib cage training and pelvis position training. I've got yes. a good chance. Yeah, I've got an even better chance if I understand devices that could go in this person's mouth that would help this person deal with their rib cage and their pelvis. If I've got a tongue that is out of control. I better have the right team assembled and I better know what tools to use. And I better be the quarterback because if I'm this team, I'm the quarterback now because the dentist doesn't know what I do, but I know what the dentist does. The myofunctional therapist doesn't know what I do, but I know what they do. And so at this moment, I'm the quarterback. Now that could change at some point. I want that dentist to be the quarterback. And then I'm going to take over being the quarterback again. And then I want the myofunctional therapist to be the quarterback. And then I'm going to take over being the quarterback again. But someone has to direct the show. And and so that is, if I don't know, then I can't be the quarterback. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not qualified to be the quarterback. So I understand right now that if I have a misbehaving tongue, one of the early things that I'm going to do is put an ALF in that mouth. I've had patients who we put an ALF in their mouth and their apnea is gone. And you can see palatal changes. I've got some palate changes on on my Instagram from a million years ago that I've stuck on there. 
or 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 you're you're dealing with someone who has apnea as a secondary thing on a 13 year old kid with scoliosis and you take their braces off and suddenly they can breathe and then their scoliosis changes i mean come on so we we had to know to take the braces off who knew mm. the dentist no the dentist doesn't know they put the braces on so we have to know who takes what off when who mm. puts what in when? Who manages rib cage while we're doing that thing? Who uh. gives them the appropriate breathing program to help them expand this thing 25%? And half the time, all they need is 5%. And apnea is gone. So you can take people and get them off a of CPAP in no time. I mean, all we know as, as providers in general, in general, mm. You have, we just did a sleep study on you and you have enough AHIs and, and other issues that suggest you have sleep apnea. Okay, let's get you on a CPAP. That's it. That's what we have. BiPAP or CPAP. Let's put you on a device and now sleep the rest of your life with a face mask. That's not fun. It's not very sexy either. So if we're going to do that, fine, but we're not doing our service to our patient. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as that provider, should say first, before I order you a CPAP, I need you to go see somebody who understands this body and this skull and these cranial strain patterns and airway. So you've got biological dentists who understand the palate. Good. We might need them. You've got a myofunctional therapist who understands a tongue. Good. We might need her. You've got a dentist who understands oral appliances. Good. We might need that dentist. You've got a therapist who understands all of it. Good. We might need him. And so let's pull all of these guys together and let's evaluate this patient and let's determine what is most important and when. Mm. That to me seems like a program that is a win-win. Costs less, less invasive, and is usually likely to get a good outcome. And if they've got a good outcome, hooray. If they don't, okay, now go get a palate expansion because you're going to have a hooray. Because I know what you don't need. You don't need yeah. what we just told you, which means you do need what they have. So now the dentist who does that gets 100%. Yes. 100% of my patients do well when I do my surgery. Yay. Everybody yeah. wins. True. Like learning ribcage, pelvis mechanics, cervical spine, like delaying a side, advancing the other, learning how it feels. Yes, and understanding how it affects these two temporal bones, because these two temporal bones are critical. If they have to move too. This occiput must move. This sphenoid bone must move. This palate must move. Both halves must move. And if they can't, you're not moving. You can move better with a little bit of rib cage work but not completely. Mm. Keep in mind, the rib cage gave us that strain. Oh. Fix the rib cage and you have a good chance of fixing the strain. But if you don't, now you know this tail is wagging this dog. It started mm. out, the dog wagged the tail, but eventually the tail can wag the dog. So we have to know when, and that comes through training and experience. So, your, if you could share your personal story, like you mentioned, you had braces on and you had to go through issues. Uh, so if you could uh, talk about that journey and how you overcame those. Oh, let's. So when I was a kid, I have a brother and I have a sister and both of them are older than me. I'm the baby. And my sister, as she grew up, had crooked teeth. So my family gave her braces to wear and it straightened her teeth. Hooray for her. My brother had straight teeth, no problem. I had a tooth right here, a canine that was coming in slowly. <clears throat> so there was a little bit of crowding going on. Well, this is back when if there was crowding, pull a tooth. Our family couldn't afford two kids with braces. Wow. So poor Mike gets a tooth pulled. Now I can tell you, I was doing a talk for a group in Japan last year. And um, everything I said was being translated and it was on a Zoom just like this. And, um, and I said, um, I don't think of tooth extractions as extractions. I call them amputations. And they went, whoa, it blew their mind. And I was like, 
good. It should blow your mind because these teeth are incredibly important. And if we can keep them, we should keep them. So rather than amputating a sense, a, a sense of proprioception, I should have been allowed to keep that tooth. I'd have rather had a crowded mouth than a missing tooth. I'll fix it myself later. When I'm an adult, I'll fix it. But just leave it alone. But no, we pulled it. Because I was a kid. What do I know? Now, what that did was it limited mid-face development on my right side. It collapsed. So that collapse increased my lateralization to the right. And I increased my bite on the right side as this collapsed. But then I became torqued. And as I became torqued, I started having issues like, some neck stiffness and this kind of nothing major, minor, but enough to bother me, but not enough to do anything about. Then I had braces to correct the crossbite that was, of course, existent at that point. So I had a, a basically a premaxillary crossbite on the upper, on the right. So that crossbite, I was I was colliding teeth right there. So we had to get me out of crossbite into normal bite, and I am now. But I was in braces. I'm still not knowledgeable. I'm learning, but I'm not knowledgeable. And um, immediately after the braces, headaches started. And I'm um, pretty severe. And I didn't even connect the dots. I'm so stupid. So I didn't connect the dots. But then over time, it, the, the, um, the headaches got worse and worse. And this is over time, meaning about two years, to the point that they were daily. And um, my headaches would range from a 6-7 on a bad day to a two, three on a good day, but always present. And every morning I had to get up because sleep made it worse. <laughs> so I couldn't lay in bed. You know, if it was a Saturday and you get to sleep in, no, that's not happening for me. You're out of bed because of pain, suboccipital pain. Well, you know what I'm doing? I'm bruxing really hard. That's what I'm doing. I'm clenching my teeth hard. So and I'm clenching to manage my airway and deal with this sensory crossbite that wants to be. So I started working with my dentist that I work with in Atlanta, and her name is Dr. Elizabeth Cahey. I've been working with her for over eight years. And Dr. Cahey builds a splint for me. We put the splint in my mouth. Three months later, my headaches are gone, gone. And, um, and I did nothing but put a splint in. I didn't even do the first any exercise at all. I'm too lazy. I didn't do an exercise. I just put a splint in and walked away and just continued treating patients. And I didn't even realize the headaches were gone. I was talking to a patient with Dr. Cahey sitting there taking notes while I was talking to the patient. And I said, yeah, um, I, uh, I, don't, I, was, I have headaches like that. I said, as a matter of fact, the last headache I had was, <laughs> gosh, I think it's been three or four months. She stops typing. And looks at me and goes, your headaches are gone? And I went, yes. I mean, it literally occurred to me that moment. And she said, you didn't say anything to me. And I was like, I didn't think about it until now. And she's like, holy mackerel. I was like, I agree. But Ankur, I can tell you that since that day, and that's been five years ago, six, seven years ago, I don't know, a long time ago, hell, maybe eight, a long time ago. If I get a headache now, it's weird, weird. And, and usually it's not from clenching. It's from something else. I don't even wear my splint anymore. It's in my case. I don't even use it. I have a splint. I have an ALF. Occasionally, I use the ALF when my ears ring. That's it. I have excellent mobility. Rib cage functions beautifully. Neck rotates nicely. I do pretty good. I have no symptoms. So, And I'm 64. I can get away with murder. I can do a lot of stuff that 64-year-olds can't do. I'm not bragging. I'm simply saying that, you know, I keep waiting for time to catch up with me because so far I'm doing okay. Knock on wood. That's my story. Awesome. What 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 are your opinions on uh, like orthodontics, uh, as you said, uh, braces and all can have an impact if everything else is not managed properly. So absolutely, I can give you a case study. So uh, about. Three years ago, I was in Virginia Beach doing some consulting with a with a therapist up there named Debbie Teller. Now, this gal owns her own Pilates studio, excellent clinician, really knows her stuff. And um, 
So I go up there about two to three times a year because she batches up people for me to see because sometimes they go outside of her scope. So I'm like, okay, so I go up there and I see him. Well, there was this one kid who was a swimmer, bilateral shoulder pain, really bad. And of course she does a butterfly. So she's got trouble. So she was 16 years old and a good swimmer, but they red shirted her. She couldn't swim anymore because the shoulders hurt too bad. So I see the girl and um, she's in braces. And I was like, hmm, is there any way we can... Um, take the wires out of your braces for a period of time. And the mom was there and she said, why is that going to help? And I said, well, it is. She goes, well, I know the orthodontist. We're really good friends and I'll make him come here and take the wires out right in front of you. I said, let's do it. So they went home that afternoon. The next day they came back and the dentist came too. the orthodontist, super nice guy. And so we were having fun talking and stuff. And then, so we put the girl on the table and I'm measuring body parts and, um, <laughs> And of course, when I'm looking at things like horizontal abduction and internal and external rotation and cervical rotation, it's all limited. So then I said, OK, open these gates and let's take the wires out. So he takes the wires out and um, immediately now she had um, internal rotation bilaterally at about five degrees, five. Now, how's a person going to swim a butterfly with five degrees of <clears throat> So the minute he takes the wire and she had pain, it was rotator cuff pain, ouch, pain free here, ouch, right there. So he takes the wires out and then immediately I retested IR, 95 degrees, zero pain. He looked at me and he said, and these are his words, he said, my God, what have I done? And I thought only a human would say that only a warm, heart filled, compassionate human being would say that. And um, and I said, you did nothing wrong. You did what you were trained to do. You did what was requested of you. This family and this nice girl came into your clinic and said, my teeth aren't straight. Can you make them look good? And you did exactly what you were supposed to do. You did nothing wrong. Now, what the ramifications are of that is she's now having difficulty with movement. Mm. And um, he said, I'd like to know more about that. So we've had conversations on the phone since then, just talking about it. And he doesn't need to be, you know, he doesn't have to be some expert or anything like that. He just needs to know. So that way, he if he has another patient who has trouble, he'll know where to send them. And he'll send them to that lady in, in um, Debbie Teller in um, Virginia Beach. So he'll send them to Debbie and Debbie can look at them and decide what to do and help him. I thought it was beautiful. There was a funny part to the story as well. She had a lateral incisor that was congenitally absent. Oh. So she had no lateral incisor. So he had a flipper there. He had a, he had a, 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 a fake tooth on the wire. So she had this big gap in her teeth. And I said, well, he goes, well, what can we do about the gap? Can I at least put a wire here that doesn't cross the palate? You know, so that it's so that it's at least here because this is the tooth that's missing. Can I keep the fake tooth and put a wire from here to here? Mm -hmm. And I said, absolutely. As long as it doesn't cross the midline fissure, we're fine. And I said, and that might she might like that a lot because right now she looks like she's from Alabama. <laughs> and we started cracking jokes because down here in the southeast, Alabama is considered country and they don't know anything. And yada, yada. So it's a running <laughs> joke. I, I joke that I'm from Georgia and we marry our cousins. But in Alabama, they're still marrying their sisters. That's the running joke. But anyway, so um, I said, we can't have her looking like she's from Alabama. So, yeah, let's put that tooth there. And then but she lived happily ever after and her teeth are straight. Now, we only left the wire off for a few weeks just to allow her to, to relearn mobility and become accustomed to the new position of her teeth. And then I asked him to put a lighter wire in place. So a lighter wire did the job because the minute a person can move their body, teeth straighten faster. Mm. And this is not well understood in orthodontics. They have to use heavy wire to move teeth a lot in a short amount of time. And they're really forcing a square peg through a round hole. Mm. Think of it like this. If, if we had a school bus with kids on the school bus, I want you to think of teeth as the kids. Mm. And the school bus is the body. Mm. Now, why straighten, why move kids around on the bus when the bus is careening off a hill? Mm. It would be better to take the, the school bus, put it on the road, 
And then the kids might sit quietly very easily. But mm. if you're careening off the road, they're just panicking. Mm. You're never going to get them right because the bus is careening off the road. Let's put the bus on the road, get it going down the road, leave the driver alone. And now the kids will sit quietly. It takes less effort. So when you have a bus driving down the road, a body that's capable of good movement into each hemisphere, now straighten the teeth. And it'll be super easy and done in less time with lighter wire and no strain. And if there is strain, if I'm a good therapist, I'll be managing for that. And if I've trained the dentist, they'll be managing for that. We'll be looking out. We'll be on the lookout. And a lot of times in pediatric dentistry, you're really just going to manage them through their growth spurts. You know, when they're 10 to 16, 17, if it's a girl, something like that. Hmm. And usually that's enough. So it's just that short six, seven year period. Manage them. Doesn't mean you need to see them every week. Get them straight. And then see him once every six months or so, or whenever the dentist sees a problem. Mm. What a great relationship. True, true. I know you have to go uh, see a client right now. I guess. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, because you have time not... for a little, like, little question. Yeah. So sure. what's, your, what's your view on, we talked about Brazil, what's your view on uh, a person in veneers? Okay, so veneers also, I've got a big opinion about that. So one of the things that happens in dentistry, uh, first of all, I have no problem with veneers. I think they're wonderful and people need them. And that's great. The big problem in dentistry is when dentists who are who do bite restorations using porcelain veneers, et cetera, they put the veneers on, especially on the front, and the patients break them. Now, immediately, the dentist is going, why are they damaging my work? I've worked hard to get these teeth right, and now my patient's tearing them up. Well, indeed, why? Why are they? And Anchor, you already know the answer. Cranium. Because, yes, cranial strain because of neck or body dysfunction. Get their HOPE score up. That hemispheric occupational performance exam. When they have high scores on a HOPE, they're not going to damage these every time. So that's the short answer for that, is uh -huh. manage the body and you will manage the veneers beautifully. I had a, a dentist who does veneers as a patient. And she destroys her own veneers. And she's like, I don't know what to do. And she's in a panic. This lady is happy as a clam right now. She <laughs> has done so beautifully. And, and I just, I love her. She's adorable. She's in Houston, Texas, the sweetest lady you'd ever meet. And I felt so bad for her when we first met because she not, she wasn't just damaging veneers. She had all kinds of problems, systemic problems, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of anxiety and dysfunction and hyperventilation, hyperinflation. And, um, and, but now, She's doing so well, and she did it all on her own with a little coaching from me. And so I was super excited about that, and she she sure is excited. So it's it. people tear up veneers for a reason. And yeah. if you do a little bit of decent investigation, you'll figure it out. Yeah. That's my opinion on Braces, veneers, make sure like you're pretty uh, mobile. Uh, you can move left to right. Then everything will be like you can manage yeah. it. And if I, if I left it with any thought, setting aside veneers and all that about human kinetics and human movement and, and, and spectrums of patterns, what I would say is when you're looking at internal rotation of upper extremities, I saw you just now do that. Consider, or horizontal abduction. Uh, Consider yeah. the patient. We, we are taught to expect to see limited left horizontal abduction. This is what we're taught. We'll see a limitation on the left and unlimited on the right. If you see the opposite, it is not a pathology. Yeah. It's not a pathology. It's movement discord that has a name. And that human needs to be looked at twice. Because if you take them to the left, you're taking them to doomsday. That's all. I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah. I, I, I also have like certain principles in my mind. Like if you don't have enough measures on your right how are you going to push from the right and get into the left? You have to have the right first. Get the right first. I love it. I love where your head is. Awesome, Mike. Awesome. Great chatting well, with I you. And, uh, hope to catch up with you someday soon. Yeah. It's yes, awesome. and I'll send you, I'm going to send you contact information on Dr. Lamb and on James yes, Anderson. Yes, please do. Please do. I would like to talk with him. Yeah. For, for the no podcast. Problem. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks Great. for letting me ramble. I talk too much. Oh, I, I learned a lot. Learned a lot. 
because okay. I, I I was talking to a lot of professionals and they told me the same thing that even braces like you like throughout the process of your braces like <clears throat> try to have like try to manage your uh, internal external rotations left yeah. right tra transition otherwise like if you're stiff there it might not be great like the consequences of it like the headaches and shoulder yes. pain neck pain almost definite almost a one to one relationship yes yes awesome. well thanks a lot for taking thank time to to let me you. hog your program i appreciate it thanks for the invitation thank you sir All right take care brother i'll see you later yeah i hope you liked this episode and if you did please like share and subscribe to my channel and i'll be coming up with such exciting episodes in the future as well thank you